Stephanie Ross. I actually teach at York, York University when we are in session. Um, but I'm also a member of the Socialist Project Labor Committee, which um, has organized this uh, session, Working Class Fight Back, Lessons of the Last Great Depression. Um, so I've been asked to uh, welcome you and introduce our speaker. And first I want to say a little bit about um, the, the Labor Committee and uh, its, its aims. Um, and really, uh, what the Labor Committee of Socialist Project aims to do is um, help to build a, a democratic and a class struggle orientation in the, in the working class and in the organized labor movement in particular, and um, is trying to work with uh, others, uh, other groups, um, to popularize a socialist orientation in the labor movement as well. Um, to do that in a, a non-sectarian way, uh, but very cognizant of the idea that um, the, the solutions, uh, both policy and political, that we have uh, developed up till now are inadequate um, and that our labor movement, in order to face the, the current, uh, not only the current crisis uh, economically and politically, uh, but, but more broadly, need to seek um, solutions that are systemic rather than dealing with the symptoms of the problem. Um, and so the Labor Committee uh, uh, seeks to, to encourage and support um, any activity that, that extends that kind of analysis and in particular critical reflection on our struggles. Um, s s not only just to pick over the bones of them, but um, in order to, to strengthen our capacities, our collective capacities to, to think through where we are as a working class, as a movement, um, and to develop the kinds of solutions that um, will allow us to build the kind of democratic um, and egalitarian society that, that we want and we desperately need. Um, uh, so this session that we're organizing today is part of um, that mandate to, to foster a space for critical reflection on struggles, to, under, to think through the, the strengths and also limits of past and present struggles in order to strengthen ourselves as a movement. Um, and it is also designed to lead into um, a conference that we're organizing for the fall, um, which is entitled Solidarity, Resistance, Transformation, Organize, Organizing Working Class Communities, what, which, to which we are calling um, people from all across the, the working class movement, whether they be in organized labor uh, or working in around working class issues outside of, of those organizations, whether in worker centers or immigrant rights movements, to come together and talk about um, not only the way in which the crisis we face is impacting our, ourselves in the different locations we find ourselves in, but also to work on creating greater unity amongst different elements in the working class, um, whether that be in terms of common strategy, um, and, and common orientation. And so um, there is a sign-up sheet going around. If you're interested in more information about that, Sarah DeClaire, who's also a member of the committee, has that. Um, so that'll go around, um, and our, our plans are ongoing. Um, and so please keep stay tuned for that. Some might wonder, wh why look at the past? Uh, why, when there are so many current pressing struggles, we should take the time to engage in some reflection on past struggles which may seem so far away and may seem like they were you know solutions or interventions designed for times that we that are no longer relevant to the things that we face um, but as uh, US historian Howard Zinn has said that he studies history not to understand the past but in order to change the future um, and it's in that spirit that the Labor Committee of Socialist Project has organized this forum on working class organizing in the Great, in the great Depression. Um, the Labor Committee believes it's crucial to draw on the resources of the past, the practices, strategies, attitudes, relationships, um, the sense of confidence and hope that people were able to generate in very dire circumstances, similar though not the same uh, to the, those that we face today. Um, uh, but we also think that learning from that history can't be simple-minded. It can't be just about romanticizing the heroic <coughs> past um, and assuming that our predecessors kind of had it all figured out. Now, instead, what 
we hope to, to have happen here today is um, a, a critical and thoughtful discussion about the about organizing in the Great Depression that recovers things that are useful to us that perhaps have been lost to our movements today um, but that also learns from the limits of previous struggles so that our interventions our struggles can be stronger and so to contribute to that kind of discussion we could think of no one better than our guest here today Brian Palmer um, who is m most of you or many of you may know is one of Canada's most prominent historians of the working class um, and whose work, I must say, has had an enormous impact on me personally as a teacher, as, as, as an activist. Um, Brian's uh, work, um, Working Class Experience, was probably one of the first books I read in Canadian labor history when I was um, uh, becoming a, uh, a teacher of labor studies. Um, it was the, the book I went to to figure out how to teach my first labor history class when I had never taken a, a labor history class myself. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it's fair to say that it had a profound influence on me, but also um, the, the other people I know who have, have read it. He's now Canada Research Chair in Canadian Studies at Trent University um, for the last seven years, and his focus is on social class and radical history in North America. Before that, he taught for 17 years in the History Department at Queen's University. Um, in the 1970s, he was... Um, important part of a movement amongst emerging historians of that time to shift the focus of labor history which in many ways had been before that kind of exclusively dominated by a focus on institutions and uh, the great leaders of the movement um, uh, and to to focus instead on the importance of social history on the lived experience of working people and on working people themselves as agents in their own history um, and an important expression of that reorientation was the journal Labour Le Travail, of wi with which he's been associated since uh, its founding in 1976, and which, of which he's been the editor for the past 11 years. Um, his body of work is very important and quite deep uh, and lengthy, um, but I'll just mention, besides the one that I've already uh, mentioned, um, two uh, latest things, Cultures of Darkness, Night Travels and the Histories of Transgression, um, which was an incredibly creative exploration of um, what happens at night and the night as a, as a space for transgression against social order, um, which left history called a rare achievement, a triumph of engaged left scholarship, truly a book of our times. Um, his last book um, was a history of um, the U.S. revolutionary James P. Cannon, uh, James P. Cannon, The Origins of the American Revolutionary Left, um, which won the Canadian History Association's Ferguson Prize uh, in the 2007 for the best book published in a field other than Canadian labor history. Um, throughout his career, um, Brian has remained committed to the telling of history from the perspective of working class people, from those excluded from the dominant narratives of history, um, not just to document their experiences, but to show the, how central working people are to the processes of social change. And this is a profoundly political commitment, and, uh, and it is in that spirit that we have invited uh, Brian to speak to us today about lessons from the Great Depression. So thank you very much. minutes, and then I think that will give us ample time for um, questions and answers. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Stephanie, and uh, thanks to Sam Gindin, uh, who uh, uh, originally contacted me. I have something worked out, but rather than sit up here and read it, and given that I would like to keep to the half hour, um, and because I think there's a, a great deal, I'm, I see myself more as someone who kind of kicks things off, and there's a lot of resources in the room. So I would, uh, <coughs> maybe what I'll do is just wander around and talk rather than uh, stick to any text. Um, and what I was asked to do was to sort of, it was free ranging on, uh, you know, sort of make some comments on, on the 30s and now. It's commonplace, of course, uh, we're hearing this everywhere uh, in bourgeois media and even from the mouths of presidents and prime ministers. Um, who, although they were saying, you know, in September of 2008 uh, that everything was really okay, 
things were fundamentally in good shape. Now we are facing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And the implicit comparison, of course, is that things were, you know, that there have been two great economic crises in capitalism uh, really in the last century, and we are now uh, in the midst of and developing further uh, another one. Um, it's astounding that there's been actually not much serious reflection on comparing those two crises and what they have meant, uh, both for capitalism and for working people, uh, in these sources of bourgeois media and this mainstream commentary. Um, and what I kind of want to talk about today is, if I was to give this uh, talk a title, it would be something like, that was then and this is now. Um, and I would like to sort of highlight in some ways some differences. And I think sadly the differences I'm going to highlight suggest that socialists in this particular moment face perhaps an even more uphill battle than did working class people and the left entering the Great Depression. Um, we haven't hit the depths of catastrophe that was so evident in 1930-31. Um, although that may come, um, but even without being ap ap apocalyptic, what I, would, what I would do want to suggest is the differences then uh, meant that uh, left critics of capitalism, working class people in the unions, uh, and all those who were opposed to what was, was happening and wanted to fight back had perhaps more leeway, a little more space, and the situation was better then. I guess in the subjective realm, uh, than in fact it is now. Um, and this isn't to be ultimately pessimistic and uh, defeatist, but it is to alert us in some senses. It seems to me it flies flags about what needs doing in the current moment. Um, I'm not going to say much about the, um, uh, uh, the sort of fundamental structural political economy and why the current crisis uh, both is similar to and different than the crisis of the 1930s. But I will flag just a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, uh, in, that, in, that, in that context, um, one, I think that you know, I, it, the logic of the crisis is very similar. <coughs> that is, there is built into capitalism a series of contradictions that inevitably lead to cyclical and, in a Marxist sense, an eventually permanent uh, crisis economy. I mean, the, the, the logic of the tendency of the, of the rate of profit to fall has, is, is the, the sort of basis for why imperialist aggression uh, has been necessary to capitalist uh, uh, formations uh, over the course of the last couple of centuries. Uh, it has fomented a series of cyclical downturns in the economy, some of uh, greater and some of lesser uh, um, impact. But built into the very logic of capitalism and its, its uh, production for, for profit and not for use is the inevitable, the inevitable uh, um, sort of immiseration of masses of people. Um, so that logic is there. But the uh, fundamental difference existed, I think, between uh, capitalism entering into crisis in the 1930s and the crisis that is unfolding now. And a, lot of, a large part of that is, is that uh, there are now in place far more regulatory mechanisms, far more uh, uh, sort of uh, capitalism's global reach is far greater. Uh, and this, I think, is, uh, you know, it, it sets a whole series of different stages. The other point is that capitalist hegemony probably entered the Great Depression of the 1930s uh, weaker in many ways ideologically than it is now. Uh, you had the existence of the Soviet Union, which for many was a bulwark of an, of an alternative, um, and, you, you, uh, the, and, and that, the, the challenge that that posed, and that that posed for the next uh, 30 or 40 years, however, uh, much the Soviet Union had in fact degenerated from a socialist society uh, was, was fundamental. Um, we live in a different period now. Uh, the U.S. imperialism arguably has never uh, been as strong as it is now 
uh, um, militarily, and yet its capacities as, as the leading capitalist nation in the world are obviously exceedingly weak and, and ridden uh, with contradictions. Um, so this kind of structural uh, political economy, which I think a great deal could be said, about, I'm going to pass over. I'm going to talk more about working class activism and the subjective realm and the issues that I think we need to sort of uh, confront. And I'm going to lay out some points for discussion. The Great Depression, of course, is remembered and often uh, seen and regarded now as a moment of massive working class upheaval. Um, but it does need to be remembered that in the opening years of the Great Depression, all indices of class struggle, in fact, suggested uh, a, uh, a stasis, these were the dog days, as leftists often referred to, to them of class struggle. Housing had sort of stalled and sputtered over the course of the 1920s, but within living memory for most workers, great upheavals such as those associated with 1919-1920 still existed as imprinted on the consciousness of workers. And when you look at the strike tallies in Canada, for instance, in 1930 and 31, they are less than a quarter of what strike tallies would have been in 1919, 1920. More importantly, the numbers of workers involved in those strikes was actually just a little more than 10 percent. So in, a, in, in what was it a, a liv of living memory? Well, the nature of the class struggle had shifted with the economic downturn quite dramatically. Unions were in an actually pretty moribund state entering the Great Depression. The dominance of the craft unions, both in Canada and the United States, was in entering the Great Depression pretty much unassailed. And the old AFL uh, conservative hierarchy was not leading in new directions. Um, so, in the very early years of the downturn, and extending really to 1934, when a militant upsurge did occur, uh, and when strike levels started to climb, and when strikes started to be more aggressive, to attain more victory, and to get out of that early depression period mode when basically workers were always fighting in a very defensive, rear guard kind of way, trying to stop uh, uh, the sort of uh, um, employer offensive and up the ante a bit and you know, strike for, for sort of extending working class gains. It wasn't really until 1934 and then again in 1937 that you see strike activity uh, climbing. And of course you don't see until 1935 the trade union movement taking an aggressive new approach to organizing. It's really with the rise in the latter half of the 1930s of the push for the Congress of Industrial Organization, the mass production organizing drives uh, led by the CIO, that you saw uh, union struggles uh, taking on new dimensions. Okay? Now, the struggles were not just uh, in the 30s, of course, for, you know, around strikes, around direct issues of, of uh, uh, the trade unions. There was also a massive unemployment movement. Um, and that did, in fact, get going in the early 30s. And it did, of course, uh, uh, have a tremendous impact. And its, its local uh, manifestations were quite pronounced and quite rich and varied. In Canada, it culminated, in some senses, in uh, the 1935 on the Ottawa track which was vis vis viciously repressed by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Regina, Saskatchewan in 1935, and also in uh, riots and other activities in 1938. So this is happening over the course of the 1930s. The critical point, however, and this is where I really want to try to make some suggestions for the difference of today, is what marked all of these struggles? What marked all of them, and what I think is profoundly different from our own period in the subjective realm, is that these class struggles of the 1930s were virtually all led 
by the left. There had been an organized left, as much as the trade unions and working people entered the Great Depression of the 1930s, somewhat in the doldrums compared with the massive upheavals of 1919 and 1920. There was nevertheless an organized left in existence. Now that organized left had its problems. I mean, from my vantage point, uh, as uh, an organized left affiliated largely with the Communist parties of Canada and the United States, it had, by the late 1920s, suffered the deterioration of the Communist International, the Stalinization of that body, and the Stalinization of those parties. But this was not fully appreciated by masses of workers in this time, who still looked to the Soviet Union, who still looked to the Communist parties as a leading edge of class struggle. And when you look at these mobilizations in the 1930s, for instance, in Canada, 90% of the strikes prior to 1934 were organized and led by communists. 90%. <coughs> if you look to the major upheavals in the United States in 1934, general strikes in Toledo, Minneapolis, and San Francisco, all three major battles which sort of galvanized the working class across the country and had kind of a ripple effect that ran through working class communities, led by in Toledo by socialists, in Minneapolis by Trotskyists, in San Francisco by communists. And the very interesting point about the Stalinization that had gone on over the late 1920s was that it ran its course through the class struggles of the 1930s in ways that in some senses fit with the particular conjuncture. And actually fed into, in some senses, the demise of the left, ironically, if you want. The third period sectarianism associated with the Communist uh, International in the very early years of the Depression 1929 to 1934, meant that communists saw themselves as a vanguard separate from all other sectors. The revolution was around the corner. They would create red unions. They would isolate themselves from the main, main, mainstream trade unions. Uh, they would lead the class struggles in the streets. This sectarianism tended to, although it produced immense battles, and while it was a cutting edge of class struggle, it tended to, in some senses, ironically, deepen that trough of inactivity. Because communists who could have been in the mainstream unions, fighting, you know, boring from within in an older land in a strategy, isolated themselves, marginalized themselves. They became the, the banner carriers of class struggle at the same time that they isolated themselves from the vast majority of workers. So in some senses, it contributed to that early inability of workers to actually mount forceful and broad-ranging struggles against uh, the deepening crisis. Of course, by 1935, the policy in the common turn had shifted and turned on a dime. And it moved away from a class against class, a denunciation of social fascists, separation of, 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 of left workers into red unions, into the Popular Front. The Popular Front was an articulation of class collaboration in some senses. It was a downplaying of the fundamental class against class impulses of that earlier period. And this interestingly fit very well <coughs> with the major trade union breakthrough of the later 1930s, the organization of the mass production, semi-skilled and unskilled workers in auto, uh, in steel, in a host of mass production uh, industries, that was championed by an old red baiter in the trade union movement from the late 1920s, John L. Lewis of the United Mine Workers. When he split from the, from the, uh, from the uh, 
when he split from the AFL in 1935 to champion the Congress of Industrial Organizations, landing a punch on the nose of uh, Big Bill Hutchison, a carpenter's leader at, a, at an AFL convention. They'd been playing poker and drinking the night before. It was all a symbol, but it was an important actual realization on the part of one of the ensconced leaders of, of, of the trade union official book, that organizing the unorganized was the key way forward in the, in the 1930s. Who did Lewis turn to to organize the CIO unions? The very communists that he'd been battering and kicking out of the United Mine Workers in the late 1920s. When asked, wasn't he worried about this? He replied cynically and with a laugh, who gets the bird? The hunter or the dog? And communists in the popular front era moved into key organizing positions in all the major CIO industrial breakthroughs. And they did heroic and wonderful work in organizing but in some senses, the gains didn't end up going so much to the left as they did to Franklin, or Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt and the Democratic Party, and to John L. Lewis, and a new layer of labor official. Um, the critical point that I want to stress is that in the current conjuncture here and now, we lack the basic organized left that had been so pivotal to the, what victories did come out of the Great Depression, which was a mixed situation. I mean, I think much was squandered, in, in my view, uh, in terms of possibilities. But what gains were made were made because of the presence of a left because of what that left could do in terms of influencing uh, activism in the unions, because of the organized capacities, because of what that left could do outside the unions, in popularizing uh, uh, a, a sense of how workers needed to fight back against the crisis. So the critical sort of framing point right now is, where is the organized left? And of course, preaching on a Sunday afternoon and converted, we all know that it doesn't really exist. And we all understand that it has to, if, the, if the sort of gains are going to be made. But a critical thing also to think about is, in some ways, that major breakthrough, that major breakthrough uh, that was led at the top by John L. Lewis and at the base by communist organizers, that breakthrough of organizing the mass production workers in the CIO. There has been no other major breakthrough in the trade union movement that I can think of since the late 1930s that compares to that. And where would we see the breakthrough that might be made in a comparable way in the current moment? And it's a difficult question to answer, and I'm not sure I have an answer for it. But it seems to me that the breakthrough that has to be, the, the breakthrough that was possible within the confines of kind of capitalist possibility on the trade union front in the 30s, it's different now. In other words, a lot of the gains that were registered, that, that commenced in the 30s, and that really had their realization in the, in the 1940s, we've lived with that. But so too has capitalism. And it is understood that it needed to curb them as capitalist crisis has been unfolding in ways small and large. So it's no accident, and you know, uh, Leo and Panitch and Don Schwartz did a wonderful book on basically uh, coercion, started as a labor literature by article and grew into various editions. And you know, that book is, is a book about what's happened since 1973 in some ways where workers have been in constant kind of defensive postures against a capitalist order and its state that has seen the need to curb the gains that came out of the original kind of upsurges of the 30s 
and that were then translated into victories in the 40s. But victories that always had a kind of two-sided character. Because those victories always incorporated, in some senses, the working class. As they, as they gained victories for the working class, they incorporated the working class into the apparatus of the state. It's what really collective bargaining victories were all about. And so, and of course, that, that marched on in the, in, in the aftermath of World War II, in the anti-communist kind of hysteria of the 1950s, where those communists who did so much to build these victories were driven into retreat. And in the last 35 years, as capitalism has gone into a tailspin since 1973, the terms of trade and the class struggle have shifted dramatically in favor of capital and against labor. And we've now lived you know, in that period, and the trade unions have lived in that period, and the political culture has adapted to that period, so that everything has shifted to the right. The left that we knew that existed in the 60s and 70s is no longer largely in existence. The trade union militancy that we knew, and that some of us saw even as late as the, eight, as, as, as the 1990s, has been waning. The state has become more aggressive. I mean, when you can actually legislate, uh, you know, uh, teaching assistants at a university back to work, I mean, <coughs> It, that, you know, for whatever one may think about that particular struggle, it's a metaphor for what's going on. There will be more and more in the current climate attacks on working people, more and more attacks on the fundamental institutions of working class life, such as the trade unions, more and more attacks on uh, the well-being of masses of people. And the only force the only force capable of shifting these terms of trade and the class struggle, which have moved so much against the working class and all of us, is the development and creation of an organized left that has learned from past victories and past defeats, and that can actually struggle to implement a program and personnel inside the unions, which are fundamental to the struggle, and outside of them as well. Without that, however many struggles take place, they will tend to be skirmishes, rather than producing a, a, the kind of outcome that I think we all want. So the message that I have in terms of, you know, and, 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 and I think, too, what is pivotal is there was room in the 1930s because of how undeveloped trade union rights and entitlements and basic welfare services were for masses of people for capitalism to grant the concessions that were struggled for, for victories to be achieved. We live in a different epoch. The space has constricted. The possibilities of securing, for instance, a breakthrough of organizing the unorganized in the mass production sectors isn't really, it's not there anymore. The space to create struggles directed at the state for relief and entitlement that produce the welfare state are not really there anymore. In other words, we have a mirror image. The victories that came out of the 30s have now become a problem for capital. Whereas in the, in the 30s and 40s, they were a possibility. They were the kinds of you know, uh, concessions and developments that could secure capitalist hegemony. Now capitalist hegemony is less concerned about the ideological realm and more concerned about the dire kind of economic vice grip that it finds itself caught with it. So, in some senses, the time is overripe for, an, for actual socialist alternatives. The time, ironically, 
is now, you know, is, 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 is the stakes have never been higher. The opportunities for kind of reformist piecemeal changes is actually off the table. The time is for humanity to sort of seize the moment and create the possibilities where out of this crisis comes not a kind of sanitized and leashed capitalism, which is what we're hearing so much about, not for, you know, uh, um, sort of shoring up capitalism. The time, it seems to me, is, is long overdue for humanity to seize the moment and create uh, an alternative to capitalism so that periodic crises and the insatiable uh, demands uh, that, that, that push uh, um, the logic of the capitalist order in the direction of more and more inequality uh, can be brought to a halt. Um, I mean, after all, it, it, it's just so obvious. If, in the aftermath of the bank failures of months ago, if, if in the aftermath, when, when the banks would take, would take the money that's given by the state to buy more banks and to concentrate capitalist power, if this had happened in flush times, the Wall Street Journal would be proclaiming, you know, Trustification. There'd be antitrust legislation. But none of this is being talked about. And unless we do something to stop the, the, and stem the tide, uh, really what's going to happen is that capitalism is going to be configured on a more concentrated, more uh, 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 um, inegalitarian basis. And the immiseration that flows in its wake will simply help us all. So that's the pessimistic but positive. <laughs>